when a vehicle arrives at the dealership with a low power complaint, it's always a cause for concern. And when the complaint is about a Dodge Ram pickup with a Cummins diesel engine, it seems particularly important to find the cause. That's because the Cummins equipped Ram pickup has established a reputation as a tough, hard-working truck. One that customers can depend on to haul or tow heavy loads. Welcome to this month's Master Tech. In this release, we're going to discuss Cummins diesel engine performance. We'll start by discussing inherent differences in engine design and the effect on performance. Next, we'll look at confirming a low power complaint and items to check during road testing. Following that, we'll discuss some possible causes of low power, including causes related to the air induction system, the throttle linkage, fuel delivery system, and fuel injection. And finally, the engine and transmission. Before we get into these causes, though, let's look at some characteristics of the Cummins diesel engine and their effect on performance. When trying to resolve low power complaints on trucks equipped with Cummins diesel engines, it's important to first make sure a problem actually exists. The Cummins diesel is designed to provide a lot of torque, especially at lower RPM. This low-end torque translates to pulling and towing power. The low-end torque results to a large extent from the Cummins diesel undersquare design. That is, the stroke is large in comparison to the bore resulting in greater leverage or force at the crankshaft. Compare, for example, the bores and strokes of some gas engines to that of the Cummins diesel. The Cummins clearly has the longest stroke in comparison to its bore. Now look at the torque curve for a Cummins diesel engine that is mated to a manual transmission. Notice that peak torque occurs at around 1600 RPM. A typical gas engine's peak torque occurs at around 2500 to 3000 RPM. Because of the undersquare design, the Cummins diesel trades power that would provide better acceleration at higher speeds for low-end torque. An additional factor in Cummins diesel performance is that diesel engines typically operate efficiently at a lower RPM range than gas engines. And other factors being equal, the higher RPM at which an engine can operate, the better the acceleration. The trade-offs become more obvious when you compare a tractor trailer with a passenger car. The tractor trailer obviously cannot keep up with the passenger car, and the passenger car obviously can't pull the trailer. Now, just because the Cummins diesel provides a lot of low-end torque doesn't mean you can carry or pull anything. There is a limit to its pulling power. A chart in this month's reference book spells out the limits. So how do you decide that a truck equipped with a Cummins diesel engine is providing a customer with low power? One way is to clock 0 to 60 mile per hour performance and compare it to a list of maximum acceptable times. These times vary according to model and have been established only for trucks with automatic transmissions. You'll find them in this month's reference book as well as in TSB 182995 Revision A. Before running the test, it's a good idea to connect the DRB3 to the Datalink connector. Having the scan tool on hand will allow you to conveniently check such items as idle speed and wide open throttle shift points during your test drive. We'll discuss the significance of these items later in the program. With the truck at curb weight, make at least two 0 to 60 mile per hour runs in opposite directions and record the times. Times that are less than or equal to the times in the chart indicate performance that is within specifications. In these cases, you may need to inform customers of some factors that can affect their perception of performance and top speed. For example, a higher numerical axle ratio may cause customers to feel an unloaded truck is accelerating more strongly at lower speeds. On the other hand, if a truck with a high numerical axle ratio is at maximum load, and being driven into a headwind on the highway, the ratio will limit top speed. If the 0 to 60 times exceed those in the chart, you'll need to investigate the truck for a low power complaint. The checks you'll need to make are the subject of the next part of this program. Before we turn to those, however, try answering this review question. 
The term for an engine in which the stroke exceeds the bore is A, understroke, B, underboard, or C, undersquare. The answer is C, undersquare. The undersquare design is a primary factor that provides the Cummins diesel with its low-end torque. In this part of the program, we're going to look at checks you'll need to make to resolve low power complaints. These checks are organized according to system, not necessarily according to sequence. However, along the way, we'll be pointing out which checks should be performed early in the diagnosis. The first possible causes we'll look at are related to the air induction system, those parts responsible for getting air into the cylinders. Checks for restrictions or blockage between the air inlet and turbocharger are relatively easy to do and should be covered early in the diagnosis. Start with the air filter. If you use the filter minder to check for restriction in the air filter, you won't have to open up the air filter housing and take the chance of debris entering the system. If the yellow disc in the filter minder has reached the red zone, the filter may be clogged. If the filter is dirty, after resetting the filter minder and changing the filter, be sure to inform the customer that the filter minder needs to be checked monthly. Keep in mind that the filter minder can indicate a clogged filter because of temporary conditions, such as snow blocking the air inlet or a wet air filter. Besides a blocked inlet or clogged or wet filter, restriction in airflow can also occur due to collapsed or kinked tubing and foreign objects in the air supply. When inspecting the air induction system, don't forget to check the outside of the intercooler for restrictions to airflow. Without the heat exchange that the intercooler provides, the turbocharger will not be able to pack as much air into the cylinders, which may affect power output. Also check the connections on the tubing which runs from the turbocharger to the intercooler and from the intercooler to the intake manifold. A leak will reduce turbo boost and power. The turbocharger and the wastegate are not usually in themselves a cause of low power and should be examined after your checks of more likely causes, such as the throttle linkage and fuel delivery system. The turbocharger wastegate is set at the factory and will not ordinarily need to be adjusted. However, it's a good idea to check the adjustment once you've explored the more common causes of low power. To check the wastegate, connect an air pressure source you can regulate and monitor the pressure on to the wastegate actuator. Install a dial indicator on the wastegate control rod to measure rod movement. On 1996 engines equipped with an automatic transmission, apply 19 PSI to the actuator. On 1996 engines equipped with manual transmissions, apply 28 PSI. With the correct air pressure applied, the control rod travel should be between 0.013 and 0.052 inches. A setting in the lower part of this range will yield optimum performance. To adjust a control rod that is not within specs, maintain air pressure on the actuator so there is no spring tension on the lever. Next, remove the control rod from the wastegate lever. Then, after loosening the jam nut, adjust the end of the control rod to line up with the lever when it is in the closed position. Do not allow the control rod to rotate in the wastegate actuator. After tightening the jam nut and reinstalling the lever, be sure to recheck the adjustment. Next, we're going to look at fuel system related causes of low power, right after another review question. How much pressure should you apply to the wastegate actuator on a 1996 engine which is used with an automatic transmission? A. 19 PSI B. 24 PSI or C. 28 PSI the answer is A, 19 PSI. For 1996 engines used with manual transmissions, the spec is 28 PSI. Our next series of checks is related to the fuel system and begins with throttle adjustments.
These checks are relatively easy to make, and they should occur early in your diagnosis, and in the order we're covering them. The first one, idle speed, is one we mentioned earlier in the program, when we were covering road testing. Hook up the DRB3, and once the truck is at normal operating temperature, make sure RPM at idle is within specifications. Remember, the specification of 750 to 800 RPM for trucks with automatic transmissions is with the transmission in drive and the air conditioning on. For trucks with manual transmissions, the specification is 780 RPM with the transmission in neutral and the air conditioning on. Idle speed that is out of adjustment can cause surging, rough idle, or stalling. You can adjust idle RPM at the idle speed screw, located at the rear of the injection pump. Loosen the lock nut and turn the screw in or out to adjust the RPM. Misadjusted low idle is a relatively rare cause of performance complaints compared to misadjusted throttle linkage. Checking linkage adjustments is easy and should be covered right after confirming correct idle speed. With the engine off, Begin your check by disconnecting the throttle cable from the ball stud on the throttle lever and making sure the end is not worn or damaged. Then measure the distance between the center of the ball and the rear face of the cable mounting bracket. It should be 5 inches exactly or 126.5 millimeters. If it's not, you need to adjust the linkage. To do this, hold the control rod with locking pliers while loosening the control rod lock nuts. Keep in mind that the lock nut towards the rear of the engine has a left-hand thread. Then turn the control rod to obtain the 5-inch dimension and tighten the lock nuts. After adjusting the linkage, operate it to check for binding and to make sure the throttle lever stop rests against the low-speed idle screw after the linkage is released. The next check, throttle lever breakover, is a crucial one. If breakover does not occur, the linkage may not allow the pump to reach wide open throttle, and that affects performance. To conduct the check, you'll need an assistant to depress the accelerator pedal to the floor while you observe the throttle linkage. The engine and key are off for this check. If the throttle linkage is operating correctly, the throttle lever to injection pump linkage rod should stop moving while the throttle lever continues to move toward the rear of the truck. If breakover does not occur, make sure an obstruction is not the cause. We're talking specifically about anything under the accelerator pedal which may be preventing it from reaching the floor, such as a rolled up floor mat or carpeting that's bunched up. The next linkage adjustment applies only to trucks with automatic transmissions. The throttle valve cable controls shift timing, speed, and quality and a misadjusted cable can affect performance. To check the cable, first make sure the throttle linkage is in the idle position. Then slide the end of the throttle valve cable off the stud on the throttle lever and check it for wear. Compare the position of the cable end to the stud. It should be aligned within about 40 thousandths of an inch in either direction. If the cable isn't positioned correctly, Press the button on the cable bracket to release the cable and push or pull the end into alignment. Once you've checked the throttle valve cable, you'll need to check the linkage for proper movement. As with the breakover check, have an assistant depress the accelerator while you observe the linkage. The throttle lever and throttle valve lever should move simultaneously as the accelerator pedal is moved to the half throttle position and back again. At one time, our next item, the Throttle Position Sensor, or TPS, only affected trucks with automatic transmissions. On trucks with automatics, the PCM uses the TPS signal as one of its inputs in deciding shifts into and out of overdrive. Early or late shifts can affect performance. Now, however, there is an additional reason for checking TPS. California trucks with the Cummins now have an EGR valve on both automatic and manual transmission trucks, and the PCM uses the TPS as an input for EGR operation. The easiest way to check the throttle position sensor is by hooking up the DRB3 and accessing the TPS voltage reading. With the throttle linkage at idle, 
the TPS reading should be at 1 volt, plus or minus 0.2 volts. Then move the linkage to wide open throttle and note the voltage. The new reading should be 2.2 to 2.9 volts higher than the one at idle. You can adjust the TPS reading by making the linkage rod shorter or longer, as described earlier during throttle linkage adjustments. As you probably guessed, the adjustment will affect the distance from the throttle lever ball stud to the rear face of the bracket, which we discussed adjusting earlier. However, if the distance changes by more than one millimeter from the specification, you'll need to replace the throttle position sensor to bring the TPS reading within spec. In other words, the TPS adjustment shouldn't cause the distance to be less than 125.5 millimeters or greater than 127.5 millimeters. Following TPS adjustment, you'll need to check throttle lever breakover to make sure the linkage is reaching wide open throttle. Also check the idle speed to make sure it has not changed. Next, we're going to cover some fuel delivery items that may result in low power. But before we do, here's a review question. The adjustment being shown here is to the A, idle speed, B, throttle position sensor, or C, throttle valve cable. The answer is B, throttle position sensor. A misadjusted throttle position sensor can affect shifts into and out of overdrive and EGR operation. When checking the fuel system, you'll first need to determine if the injection pump is being provided with good quality fuel in sufficient quantity. A fuel delivery system that is compromised by substandard or incorrect fuel, excessive water, or air leaks may result in hard starting, rough idle, rough running, and low power. Advise customers to be sure to follow the fuel recommendations in their owner's manuals. Besides using the recommended fuel, customers can also avoid problems by checking for water with the drain valve at the bottom of the water fuel separator. Remind customers that to avoid problems, they should check for water and drain it once a month. This is a particularly important reminder if the truck arrived with the water in fuel lamp on. If the fuel system has been taking in air because of a loose or faulty connection, you'll probably be able to locate the spot by looking for fuel that is leaking out. Another cause of excessive air in the system is replacing the fuel filter without filling the replacement with fuel. If you do need to bleed air from the low pressure side of the system, you can do so by loosening the low pressure bleed bolt and operating the primer on the lift pump until the fuel that comes out is free of air. Usually, air that reaches the injection pump will work its way out through the fuel drain manifold while the engine is cranking or running. However, in some cases, in order to purge the high pressure side, you may need to bleed one injector at a time until the engine starts and runs smoothly. In such cases, do not crank the engine longer than 30 seconds at a time, and wait two minutes before cranking again. Also, injector spray is under very high pressure and can penetrate the skin, so be sure to wear gloves when bleeding the high pressure side. For more information about bleeding procedures, be sure to refer to Group 14 in the Ram Truck Service Manual. In addition to contaminants or air, restrictions in the fuel supply to the injection pump can also cause problems. You're probably well aware of the importance of having a fuel filter that is operating properly. A clogged or restricted filter can cause a no start, low power, or excessive white smoke. But keep in mind that a clogged pre-filter screen in the fuel heater can have the same effect. So be sure to clean the pre-filter each time you change the fuel filter. One way to check for restriction is by running a pressure check of the fuel delivery system. To do this, install the tools from Special Tool Kit 6977 on the fuel injection pump. Special tool number 6976, the fuel feed line adapter, is installed at the injection pump fuel inlet. And special tool number 6828, the diesel low pressure gauge, is installed on the adapter. With the tools in place, start the engine and allow it to idle. At idle, the gauge should read 17 to 22 PSI. 
raising the engine speed to 2,250 RPM should cause the gauge reading to rise to at least 25 PSI. Do not automatically condemn the lift pump if pressure is low. As discussed earlier, the fuel filter or pre-filter could be clogged, or the injection pump overflow valve could be at fault. If the filters are at fault, the pressure reading will rise once you've serviced them. Besides the filters, a faulty overflow valve could also be causing the low reading. To find out if this is the case, carefully squeeze the rubber return line with vice grips while observing the gauge. If the pressure rises, the overflow valve is at fault and must be replaced. If the reading is still low, the lift pump is probably the cause. A much less common cause of low pressure is restriction in the tank or the fuel supply lines. The service manual contains a test for fuel line restriction in group 14. A fuel injector that is malfunctioning can result in a dead cylinder, causing low power. You can check quickly for a dead cylinder with a digital thermometer. Place the thermometer probe against each individual exhaust runner. The runner that is significantly cooler indicates the dead cylinder and possibly the injector that is malfunctioning. If you do need to service fuel injectors, be sure to use the correct washers. The washers on fuel injectors used on all 1994 and 95 engines and on 96 engines equipped with automatic transmissions are 1.5 millimeters thick. Those on injectors intended for use on 1996 engines equipped with manual transmissions are half a millimeter thick. We've saved the fuel injection pump for last in our discussion of the fuel system and for good reason. For one thing, checking pump timing is time consuming and should usually come last in your series of checks. Also, the fuel injection pump is an expensive part that should not be condemned until all other causes have been eliminated. A mistimed or malfunctioning injection pump can cause a number of symptoms, including low power. If the symptoms include white smoke and rough idle when cold, it indicates retarded pump timing. To check pump timing, First, disconnect the pigtail harness from the fuel shutdown solenoid. Then attempt to start the engine a few times to eliminate the chance the engine may temporarily start on residual fuel. Then remove the rocker cover so you can observe the number one cylinder's intake and exhaust valves. Also remove the plug from the flywheel access hole. The hole is located on the engine's rear flange on the exhaust side. Insert a barring tool into the hole. Then rotate the tool counterclockwise while maintaining pressure on the timing pin. The pin is located under the fuel injection pump. When the engine is rotated to the top dead center position, you'll be able to push the timing pin into the hole in the camshaft gear. If you're on the compression stroke for the number one cylinder, the intake and exhaust valves for that cylinder will be closed. At this point, mark the crankshaft dampener in relation to the engine to establish top dead center. Also, pull the pin out of the camshaft gear so you don't break it when you rotate the engine later on. Next, remove the high pressure line for the number one cylinder from the fuel injection pump and loosen the number one delivery valve holder using special socket 6840, but do not use the socket to remove the holder. Instead, Carefully tip the holder with one hand while using the other one to hold the bottom so the spring, fill piece, and shims do not slip out. Place these and all other injection pump parts on a clean surface. Then use a magnet to remove the two pieces which make up the delivery valve assembly. And use a pick to remove the delivery valve washer if one is present. If you remove a washer, be sure to use a new one when reassembling the pump. At this point, you'll need to install some special tools in the number one delivery valve holder. The tools consist of the adapter, number 6842, and the dial indicator and tip, numbers 6859 and 6843. First, install the adapter finger tight and make sure its set screws are loose. Then install the dial indicator with its tip. Position the indicator to read between 7 and 9 millimeters, as indicated on the inner dial, and tighten the set screws. The divisions on the inner dial represent 1 millimeter. 
one revolution of the needle on the inner dial represents 10 millimeters. However, keep in mind that the indicator is capable of measuring 20 millimeters, or two revolutions of the inner dial. The divisions on the outer dial represent one hundredth of a millimeter, and one revolution of the needle represents one millimeter. Next, with the special tools in place, rotate the engine opposite normal rotation one quarter turn, or until you see the dial indicator needle stop moving. This is the inner base circle on the cam lobe for the number one pumping element. You can get a rough idea of the extent of dial indicator travel by referring to the plunger lift specifications. Then zero the outer dial. At this point, rotate the engine in the normal direction using the timing pin to once again locate top dead center. If the pump is timed correctly, top dead center should position the tip of the cam lobe directly under the indicator, and the dial revolutions should indicate the correct amount of lift. To find out if this is the case for 1994 to 1996 engines, compare the reading to those in the diesel timing specs TSB, which you should be receiving shortly. If the reading is not within specifications, you can use the procedure in the service manual to adjust pump timing, or you can remove the pump and send it to the nearest Bosch service center. See the Bosch service dealer directory for the service center closest to you. Bosch service centers should also be listed in your local phone directory. Sending the pump out to be calibrated has certain advantages because Bosch personnel have the equipment to check the pump out completely. Now that we've covered fuel system related causes, let's check your knowledge with a review question. A low pressure reading at the fuel supply inlet of the injection pump increases after the fuel return line is closed off. What is the most likely cause? A. Lift pump. B. Overflow valve. Or C. Fuel filter. The answer is B. Overflow valve. Easing off the return line is a way of narrowing down the cause of low pressure. Engine and transmission related causes may also result in a low power complaint. Early checks should include the valve clearance adjustment. This adjustment is also a part of scheduled maintenance, which should be performed after the first 24,000 miles or 24 months and every 48,000 miles or 48 months after that. In addition to low power, valves that are out of adjustment can cause harsh starting or rough running. Keep in mind, we're talking about valves that are significantly out of adjustment, not merely a couple of thousands. The adjustment involves placing the engine at top dead center on the compression stroke for the number one cylinder, as described earlier during injection pump timing. After locating top dead center, be sure to put a paint mark on the dampener and the engine for reference. You'll need them to reposition the crankshaft for the second set of valve adjustments. At top dead center, you can adjust number one intake and exhaust, number two intake, number three exhaust, number four intake, and number five exhaust. The clearance for intake valves is ten thousandths of an inch, and the clearance for exhaust valves is twenty thousandths of an inch. To adjust the rest of the valves, rotate the crankshaft 360 degrees. Don't forget to pull out the timing pin before doing so. Then you can adjust number two exhaust, number three intake, number four exhaust, number five intake, and number six intake and exhaust. You wouldn't ordinarily think of the transmission as being the cause of low power but the automatic transmission in particular should be considered a possible cause. Earlier when discussing the road test, we suggested connecting the DRB3 to monitor wide open throttle shift points. That's because shift points that are too low or too high can cause poor performance. Wide open throttle shifts should occur at an engine speed of 2500 RPM, plus or minus 100 RPM. A throttle valve cable that is out of adjustment is one possible cause of shift points that are not within spec. We discussed how to check and adjust this cable when we covered throttle linkage, and this is one possible cause you should catch early in your troubleshooting. The diagnosis charts in Group 21 of the service manual list other possible causes, 
So be sure to refer to them if shift points are not where they should be. Our final check is maximum stall speed. You can use stall speed to check for our final two possible causes of low power, a malfunctioning torque converter or transmission clutches that are slipping. To perform the stall test, first drive the truck to bring the transmission fluid to normal operating temperature. And if you haven't already done so, check the transmission fluid level and add fluid if necessary. Then connect the DRB3 to the data link connector and access engine RPM. Next, after blocking the front tires, apply the parking and service brakes. And place the gear shift selector lever in drive. At this point, open the throttle completely. Allow the engine four to 10 seconds to achieve maximum RPM. And record the reading. Once you reach maximum RPM, do not hold the throttle open for longer than four to five seconds and do not hold the throttle open if RPM exceeds 2,500 RPM. The normal range for stall speed is 1,800 to 2,300 RPM. The service manual contains a stall test analysis, which you should refer to following the test. In addition to possible causes of low or high RPM, it discusses noise and poor performance that may be caused by the torque converter. In fact, we're going to use the service manual information about the stall test as the basis of our next question. A stall speed that is too high usually indicates transmission clutch slippage. True or false? The answer is true. A high stall speed usually indicates slipping transmission clutches. A low stall speed, on the other hand, usually indicates a problem with a torque converter overrunning clutch. That's about it for our look at troubleshooting Dodge Ram pickups with Cummins diesel engines. The checks described in this program should help you get to the bottom of most low power complaints. As always, when troubleshooting, be sure to first consider the causes which are more common and easiest to check. Join us next month when our topic will be fuel basics. We'll see you then.